very happy to have all of you here. It's a beautiful day, and uh, even though it's a little dim in here, we know that the sunshine is waiting for us out there. Um, it's my great pleasure to welcome you to the 2022 Stan and Joan Pearson Lecture, uh, the history department's most anticipated intellectual event of the year. Don't, uh, it, it's a real honor here. Uh, this annual lecture is a special occasion for the Department of History. Uh, the Pearson Lecture honors Stan and Joan Pearson, two exemplary citizens of the university and the Eugene community, whose dedication to history seemed to know no bounds. The Pearson Lecture, which the Pearson family created in 1993, um, was only one example of that dedication. Over the course of their lifetimes, Stan and Joan made countless contributions to the social, intellectual, and spiritual life of Eugene. Uh, Joan was an ordained minister and an accomplished teacher with wide-ranging interests in literature, theology, and feminism. Stan was a professor of history and the author of four distinguished books, mostly about uh, the history, the intellectual history of European socialist thought. Both lived long enough to enjoy quite a few of these occasions. Joan died in 2012, Stan died in 2013. Their loss continues to be felt deeply within our community. In 2014, the Pearson's three sons, Michael, Paul, and Kit, endowed the Pearson Lecture in memory of their parents. Their generosity will allow us to continue this lecture series for many years to come. We're deeply grateful for each of them and to their families for the opportunity they've given us to remember Stan and Joan in a way that does them justice by continuing our education and by continuing the conversations they participated in about things that matter to us all. If their family members are able to hear this recording, I know they're not able to make it today, a genuine thanks, so please join me. And it's more than just perfunctory that we have to thank our staff. We have such a remarkable group of staff in this department. Um, it's such a shame that we lost Nick, but he went on to, to greener pastures, and before he did so, he helped contribute to this visit by booking travel and helping make early arrangements. Fela McWhorter um, also continued that, those arrangements, made the beautiful poster, and uh, continued to communicate with uh, Professor Myers throughout the, the visit. And then, of course, the incomparable Lauren Pynchon, our department manager, um, who continued to make arrangements for meals and travel and scheduling and all the rest. Uh, please join me in thanking our wonderful staff. Um, and now it's my pleasure to introduce our distinguished speaker, Dr. Amrita Chakbari Myers, who is Ruth N. Hall's Associate Professor of History and Gender Studies at Indiana University. Dr. Myers earned her PhD in U.S. History from Rutgers University, where she specialized in African American and women's history. A historian of black women, her research focuses on race, gender, and freedom in the Old South. Professor Myers is the author of Forging Freedom, Black Women and the Pursuit of Liberty in Antebellum Charleston, which was published by the University of North Carolina Press in 2011. Forging Freedom draws on legislative and judicial materials, probate data, tax lists, church records, and family papers to create detailed portraits of individual black women in Charleston as they sought to create fuller freedom by improving their financial, social, and legal standing. Just a few of the words used by reviewers to describe this study should give you a sense of its scholarly reception. These are all quotes. Important, compelling, groundbreaking, carefully researched, lucidly written, richly documented, fascinating, vivid, remarkable. I could go on and on. The book was recognized with four major awards for scholarly distinction. The 2012 Julia, Cheryl, Julia Cherry Sproul Prize from the Southern Association for Women Historians. The 2011 George C. Rogers Jr. Award from South Carolina Historical Society. The 2011 Anna Julia, Anna Julia Cooper CLR James Book Award, National Council for Black Studies and the 2012 Phyllis Wheatley Book Prize from the Northeast Black Studies Association. Professor Myers also has a distinguished record of public-facing work and social justice work. In 2012, this work was recognized with the Martin Luther King Jr. Building Bridges Award from Indiana University. Myers' contributions have taken many forms on and off campus. In 2015, she was the lead organizer of It's Not So Black and White, Talking Race from Ferguson to Bloomington, a Black Lives Matter teach-in 
which uh, Allison, Madar, and I were lucky to attend. Um, and in 2017, she organized a town hall titled Violent Intersections, Women of Color in the Age of Trump. This led to the creation of Indiana University's Social Justice in America series. Events designed to bring town and gown together each year to have to tough talks on tough topics. In 2020, the SJAS theme was defending democracy, confront confronting voter suppression and white supremacy in the new millennium. Myers is regularly interviewed by the media about racial justice matters. In 2018, she appeared on PBS NewsHour with Judy Woodruff to talk about unconscious bias. In 2020, she was invited to discuss Juneteenth and equity issues on Fox and Friends, a study I can't, I mean, a, a, an event I can't wait to talk to you about at dinner. Uh, t since 2015, she's been one of the co-anchors of Indiana's award-winning WFHB African American radio show, Bring It On. She's published, or her published op-eds and interviews have appeared in various publications, including the Louisville Courier Journal, the Washington Post, the Indianapolis Star, and the Bloomington Herald Times. Professor Myers' second monograph, which she has now sent off to the press, about a hand there. We all know what a feeling that is, and it's remarkable. Congratulations. It will be released by Ferris and Ferris Books in 2023. Today's talk will be drawn, drawn from this forthcoming work, and it is titled, When the Archives Don't Easily Speak, The Life and Times of Julia Chin. Please join me in welcoming Dr. Myers. I'm a little embarrassed by that introduction. <laughs> Dr. Rushworth said that he had found all kinds of quotes, and now I know what he meant. <laughs> I am so incredibly honored to be here, and just thank you all for taking time out of your very busy schedules uh, to join us here this afternoon. I know that quarter systems are incredibly fast-paced and hectic. Uh, you know, nine, ten weeks, that's, that's a lot. So thank you for making time to be here this afternoon. Um, I want to take a moment to especially thank um, uh, Professor Rushforth, who you know, sort of helped to conceive of this way back in January um, and started the ball rolling on bringing me here. Um, and also uh, Vera Keller, who unfortunately cannot join us. Um, I was looking forward to, to meeting Vera, so I want to thank her for taking over. Um, and continuing um, the work, but also Nick Malum, who I understand is no longer in the department, but who did a lot of groundwork um, in helping to put uh, the pieces together. Uh, Fila McWhorter, who just did a beautiful job on the poster, um, the flyer uh, for the, the, the advertising, and has been communicating with me uh, about all kinds of matters. And then last but certainly not least, um, Lauren Pynchon, who really deserves an award, um, and I told her she is a rock star. And really, I want to give her a round of applause because she's amazing. I have never received emails with hyperlinks to shopping, museums, hiking trails, vineyards. I mean, I, I'm just, I have done a lot of talks in a lot of places, and I have to say, this has been one of the most amazing trips I've had, and it's really um, in no small part to all of the work that she has done. Um, it's been seamless. So I'm, I'm truly, she's amazing. She's amazing. So thank you, Lauren, for everything that you've done to, um, to get me here. Um, and everyone has been taking me out for dinners, <laughs> you know, uh, you know, Bryna and Ruben and Ellen, Julie, so many people have taken me out and hosted me. It's just been a wonderful trip, so thank you. Um, and I've had a wonderful talk this after, earlier this afternoon with several of your graduate students, and that was really a delight, because um, that's one of the things that I enjoy the most is um, speaking with, with students. And that was, that was a lot of fun. So, but now I'm gonna um, give you all, you get the first, you know, advanced book talk, really. Um, because the book will be out in, in February or March at the latest, and, um, but I just turned in the manuscript a few weeks ago, and so um, you get a sneak peek at, at what's coming. So, you know, I'm at heart a storyteller. 
that that's really what I like to do. And today, so today I'm gonna, you know, I'm gonna tell you a story, and it's drawn from the forthcoming project, which is titled The Vice President's Black Wife, The Untold Life of Julia Chin. And it centers the lives of enslaved and de facto free black women in the Old South, which has been the focus of my work for over two decades. And as I tell my students, the study of US history is at its core, the study of power relations. But I, res I happen to research power by studying sex, interracial sex. Now, interracial sex between slaveholders and the enslaved occupies you know, fairly significant space in the American imagination. The most obvious example, of course, is the public's long interest in Sally Hemings and Thomas Jefferson. But that relationship wasn't unique. Sex across the color line began the moment that various ethnic groups came into contact with one another on this side of the Atlantic. Those interactions were varied and complex, ranging from a single night of mutual pleasure to more complex business transactions, from violent assaults to more consensual relationships, with many points in between. My work focuses on illuminating how some black women were able to use sexual partnerships with white men to acquire power in the Old South while simultaneously revealing the limits of that power. How much autonomy did black women in these unions actually have? What were the societal limits of their privilege? Did black women have any choice when it came to participating in these relationships? What kinds of constraints did they face at home? How did white people respond to interracial couples and to their children? Additionally, while no two situations are ever exactly the same, we can draw comparisons between similar partnerships to draw some useful conclusions about black-white power relations. So with that in mind, I'd like to introduce you to Julia Chin. I uncovered her story in a strange and yet familiar way. It was, as it so often seems to be, through the life of a white man. In 2009, as I was preparing to teach the first half of the US History Survey, I came across a brief mention of a vice president from Kentucky named Richard Mentor Johnson in a textbook. Johnson, vice president under Martin Van Buren in the late 1830s, never married a white woman, but supposedly lived in, quote, open, scandalous, scandalous concubinage, right, with several different enslaved women. Used by northern politicians and abolitionists alike as an example of how immoral southern plantation owners sexually abused enslaved black women, I sort of wondered, who was this man? And how had I never heard of him? <laughs> I mean, I'm a 19th century historian, and I literally had never heard of Richard Johnson. So I resolved to return to this at some point. The following year, I had a conversation with my then colleague, Christina Snyder, who had just begun her research on Choctaw Academy. A Native American boarding school located in Scott County, Kentucky, Choctaw Academy was located on the farm of a prominent politician who became Vice President of the United States, Richard Mentor Johnson. And I remembered the passage from my textbook, and I asked Christina if this was the same man who had engaged in sexual relationships with several of his enslaved laborers over the course of his life. She, she confirmed it was the same guy, you know, it's the same man, but she said, you know, it's a, it's, a lot, it's a lot more complicated than the textbook, you know, suggests. Johnson had lived with one of the women, Julia Chin, for over two decades, and had two daughters with her, Imogene and Adeline. But nobody had ever written a sustained study about Julia or her daughters. Says I, well, somebody should write a book about her. <laughs> we need to know more about black women in the Old South, particularly those whose lives can help us better understand things like black, free, you know, black female freedom, power, privilege. Having read my first book, Christina replied somewhat half-chokingly, isn't that kind of what you do? So I went home that day and I began looking up Julia Chin online. I was struck by how little scholarly material I found. There was a biography of Richard that had been written back in 1932. That was the last one. There were a handful of articles about Choctaw Academy dating back to the early 20th century. There were some websites that focused on discussing the, quote, boozing and bounding ninth, ninth vice president, a man who supposedly enjoyed having affairs with the wives of his colleagues on the Hill, in addition to his fondness for enslaved women. There was also the standard wikipedia.com site, which had some decent factual material. So much of what was available had no citations. It was gossip used for shock value, and very little of it was actually about Julia. 
Having already written one book that pieced together antebellum black women's lives from fragmentary public records, I had some idea of what I was getting myself into if I took on this project. I assumed this would be easier, though. Richard Johnson was a career politician who had lived in the public eye for well over 40 years. Congressman, senator, vice president, he would have left behind a large collection of archival materials. And while I wasn't interested in writing a book about Richard, I knew that I would have to use his materials to write about Julia, that I would have to go through him to get to her. Now this, of course, is one of the frustrating realities of the work that I do, that in order to reconstruct the lives of enslaved women, to write black women back into the historical narrative, I have to use materials created by white men who never intended for their documents to highlight black women's voices. To recover the stories of 19th century black women then, who left behind few firsthand accounts of themselves, we as scholars have to be willing to ask different questions of the archives, to use new methods of analysis with existing records, to read against the grain. The challenges of doing this kind of work are many. How do we use data created by the very people who exploited black women, material that was never supposed to tell black women's stories to reconstruct their lives? How do we read between the lines to give flesh to skeletal remains, responsibly analyzing the silences? How can we ensure that black women remain at the center of our work and are not overshadowed by the men in their lives, men who created the paper trail that we rely on and about whom more information exists? How do we maintain a responsible ethic of care so that we don't reinscribe violence onto the women we study? Women who were already subjected to terrors most of us cannot even begin to imagine. What do we do when the archives do not easily speak or tell comfortable stories? I expected these challenges as I prepared to write Julia's story. But what I wasn't ready for was the fact that there was no large collection of Richard Mentor Johnson archival materials. Richard had spent 44 years in state and national politics, but there was no gigantic repository of his papers anywhere in the country. Not in Washington, D.C., where the Library of Congress had only a small collection of about 160 letters, almost entirely related to financial matters and business correspondence. And not in his home state of Kentucky, where I would spend about eight years scouring libraries and archives in Louisville, Frankfurt, Georgetown, and Lexington in my efforts to discover any information that I could about Julia Chin and her daughters. I'm now certain that when Richard died in 1850, his two surviving brothers, John T. Johnson and Henry Johnson, destroyed his papers in an attempt to erase any and all evidence of the existence of Julia Chin by then deceased and the couple's two children. This was partly so they could inherit what little property their brother died still owning, and partly because they were desperately ashamed that he had been involved with a black woman for almost a quarter century and had descendants by her. Claiming that Richard had died without a will and with the help of a racist local probate judge who full well knew that Richard had a daughter and several grandchildren living in the area, John and Henry got away with robbing Imogene Johnson Pence of what little remained of her father's estate. I was absolutely horrified when I realized what John and Henry had likely done. The lengths to which they had gone to try and erase the Johnson women from existence. Julia and her daughters, unlike most Southern black women of their time, were literate. Amongst the papers those two men destroyed were hundreds of letters the three women had written to husband and father during the months that he lived in Washington, D.C. every year while they remained in Kentucky, caring for the family's business interests. What the Johnson brothers couldn't do, however, is destroy the letters that Richard had written to other people. They also couldn't erase the church registers and newspapers, the government correspondence and census materials, the deed books and estate papers, they couldn't eradicate the church buildings and gravestones, the schools and home sites, or the memorabilia that was eventually passed down through the generations to Julia and Richard's descendants, although time aided in the erosion of some of these sources. 
These materials, when added to existing oral histories and my own descendant interviews, laid against corroborating evidence from the lives of other enslaved women from the era, are the foundation of the Vice President's black wife. Let us turn then to Julia. Family tradition says that Julia Ann Chin was born enslaved and raised on the farm of Robert and Jemima Suggett Johnson of Great Crossing, Kentucky. We don't know exactly when she was born, but former Johnson family slaves state that Chin was only 15 or 16 when her first daughter, Imogene, was born in 1812. That means that Julia was born around 1796 or 1797, making her roughly 16 to 17 years younger than the Johnson's son, Richard Mentor Johnson, who was born in Beargrass, now the city of Louisville, Kentucky, in 1780. We know that Julia was enslaved because her mother, Henrietta, was also enslaved by Robert and Jemima. The senior Johnsons had moved to Kentucky from Virginia and helped to settle the territory. While Julia and Richard grew up on the same farm, it's unclear how much time they spent together as children. Jemima supposedly raised Julia to be a house servant and trained her by hand. If so, she would have spent a lot of time in the big house, learning to cook, clean, sew, weave cloth, read and write, as well as acquiring the medical skills for which she would later be known. She likely lived in the main house after about the age of six, which is when serious instruction began for most enslaved domestics. Given the large age difference between the pair, however, and the fact that Richard studied law at Transylvania University in 1800 before being admitted to the bar in 1802 and then elected to the Kentucky State House in 1804, it's possible that the two had very limited or no contact while they were growing up. Richard then moved to Washington, D.C. in 1806 after becoming the first native-born Kentuckian elected to Congress. Although she had begun work at a very early age, things truly changed for Julia when she became Richard's housekeeper. That was the day that her childhood truly ended. Richard had inherited a significant amount of property from his father, including 100 enslaved laborers. He then built himself an impressive two-story brick mansion with two rows of brick cabins for his slaves. When the house was finished, his mother came to help him furnish his house. She told Richard that he needed a housekeeper to keep things in order for him, a woman who would oversee everything at Blue Spring. Jemima then told Richard that she had already gone down to the slave quarters and selected Henrietta's girl for the job. Julia was 14 years old at this point, quote, well-trained and almost pretty, end quote. Mrs. Johnson was quite enthusiastic about her qualities as a potential housekeeper, stating the girl was, quote, neat and trim, quick in movement, and will not grow up bul bulky and awkward. She weighs only 90 pounds and will look well around the house, end quote. There's no telling what ran through Julia's mind as she got ready to move into the big house and take up her new post. It was no small task being a housekeeper, especially for a bachelor politician, with no wife on the premises, it meant managing Richard's large house, overseeing the household staff, and for Julia, it would also mean organizing the fabulous parties for which Richard was known. Housekeepers were powerful persons on large plantations. Julia would carry the keys to the estate. She would handle all the deliveries of and payments for supplies and goods. She would choose the daily food menu, take care of any house guests, over organize and oversee work assignments and handle the, handle the punishments for the household staff and more. While this might sound quite privileged, there were also real risks to being a housekeeper. It was common for white men who engaged in sexual relationships with enslaved women throughout the Atlantic world to refer to their black mistresses as their housekeepers or for their housekeepers to be their mistresses. <laughs> Indeed, there appeared to be a very fine line between the two. One wonders if this long history 
of sexual relations between masters and housekeepers was on Julia's mind as she prepared to take on the role of Richard's menagere, as they were called in French-speaking areas like Saint-Domingue and New Orleans. It certainly didn't take long for this to happen. By 1811, when Julia was 14 or 15 and Richard 31, the pair had begun a sexual relationship that would last 22 years and produce two daughters. Due to the archival issues that I discussed with you earlier, there are things that we just don't know about Julia. For instance, we're not sure what she looked like since there are no confirmed portraits of her. At only 90 pounds neat and trim, she was apparently a tiny person. And everyone agrees that she was a woman of African descent. She has, however, been referred to at various times as a Negro, an African, brown, mulatto, yellow, or an octoroon who was, quote, fair enough to pass for white, end quote. The nature of Julia and Richard's relationship is also up for debate. Was she Richard's legal wife? His willing partner, and I put willing in quotes for a reason, or his coerced mistress? Some people considered the pair to have been a married couple, concluding that despite her legal status as a slave, since Richard treated Julia like his wife, and she did all the work of a wife, and because she was the mother of his children, that she was indeed his wife. The couple's former enslaved laborers claimed that the pair had an actual marriage ceremony, complete with Julia in a pink silk dress, guests, cake, violins that played the popular wedding ballad of the day, I Will Be True, and a minister named Hayes. This all sounds very romantic. <laughs> yes, but given the couple's age difference, and Julia's lifelong status as an enslaved laborer, it's highly doubtful that this was a consensual partnership in the beginning, if ever. Additionally, there is no Reverend Hayes in the Scott County Census records. The Johnson family also had a long history with Great Crossing Baptist Church, which Robert and Jemima, Richard's parents, had helped to found. Why wouldn't Richard ask a minister from that church, which he and Julia attended, to marry them? It would have actually made the most sense for the couple to ask Thomas Henderson to marry them, given their connection to the man, as we shall soon, we will, you know, quickly see. Captain John Wilson, who was a contemporary of Richard's, claimed that Julia and Richard had in fact been secretly married by Henderson. But there is nothing in Henderson's papers to suggest this, and no marriage license has ever been recovered for the pair, although that could have been destroyed when Richard's papers went up in smoke at his death. Whatever the legalities, people clearly believed that Julia and Richard were a married couple. Judge James Kelly, who knew Richard when the judge was a young man, said that, quote, old Colonel Johnson had a mulatto wife end quote. And Richard himself referred to Julia as his wife. In a letter to a friend, Richard mentioned, quote, my bride, end quote. And he supposedly released a statement to the press during the election of 1836 when he was running for the vice presidency, which stated, quote, unlike Jefferson, Clay, Poindexter, and others, I married my wife under the eyes of God and apparently he has found no objections, end quote. Since all three of the men referenced had black partners or mistresses at some point in their lives, we can assume that Julia was referring to, Ju uh, Richard was referring to Julia in this statement. Even if the state didn't recognize his union, having outlawed interracial marriage, Richard clearly believed that the laws of God trumped the laws of Kentucky. Clearly there are things for Julia Chin that are up for debate. What then can we actually say about her? We know she was a woman of color, that she was literate, that she and Richard lived together for over two decades, and that they had two daughters together. Richard never denied that Imogene and Adeline were his children. He had them educated, he called Julia his wife, and since his career kept him in Washington DC for six months each year, 
It was Julia who handled the day-to-day -day business of running Richard's plantation, Blue Spring Farm. This included dealing with local businessmen and overseeing the estate's labor force. A God-fearing woman, she also attended Great Crossing Baptist Church, where she was baptized in 1828. She also had regular contact with the headmaster and students of a federally funded boarding school for indigenous boys located at Blue Spring. Known as Choctaw Academy, the school opened in 1825 and remained in operation until 1848. Julia helped to run the school and made it a success. It is Richard's letters to Thomas Henderson, who was headmaster of Choctaw Academy, that give us additional insight into Julia's life. She and her daughters, Imogene and Adeline, all lived at Blue Spring Farm. It isn't clear, however, if Julia and Richard always slept in the same house together. There were several prop buildings on the property, including a large brick dwelling that Richard referred to as my great house. It's possible that the couple lived together when Richard was in Kentucky. But Julia also had her own place at Blue Spring, a stone house. In this way, Julia's life mirrored that of Anna Kingsley, who was the enslaved wife of a Florida slave trader named Zephaniah Kingsley. Anna resided in a pretty two-story brick and wood frame house with her children. Like Anna Kingsley, Julia's position in Richard's life appears to have earned her the privilege of her own home. It was a structure large enough to house a three-room library. Julia may have negotiated this house as part of the couple's relational arrangement. Anna Kingsley, however, would eventually be freed along with her children, unlike Julia. As an enslaved person, Julia wasn't legally permitted to own anything. This was never really her house. Slave owners like Richard Johnson made it clear that their plantations and everything on them was their property. Richard once told Thomas Henderson that if more space was required for the students of Choctaw Academy, he, Richard, would just take over Julia's house for that purpose. Quote, at any time I could appropriate that whole house if necessary, end quote. One wonders how Julia felt knowing she could be turned out of her own home by the father of her children whenever he wished. An enslaved woman, Julia Chin walked a fine line between having power and being someone's property. Still, she exercised considerable authority as manager of Blue Spring. Like slave trader Zephaniah Kingsley, Richard Johnson's job meant that he was away from home for months at a time. Both men relied on and trusted their black wives to make sure that things ran smoothly in their absence. Kingsley noted that Anna was trustworthy and, trustworthy and capable and that she could run the plantation as well as he could in his absence. Similarly, Richard Johnson told Thomas Henderson, who functioned in some ways as overseer of Blue Spring, that Julia would make sure everyone did their job. Thomas would only have to help her if she became ill, just to make sure that the laborers, quote, didn't get out of hand, end quote. Holding the keys to the plantation firmly in her grasp, like other plantation mistresses, both white and black, Julia Chin oversaw a variety of matters at Blue Spring. Probably her most important task, however, other than raising her daughters, was directing the farm's enslaved laborers. It was her job to make everyone, quote, do their duty, to behave and be industrious. In fact, she told Thomas Henderson which of Blue Spring's slaves, quotes, acts well, and who among them, quote, acts ill. Henderson, in turn, was to, quote, support her authority, her authority. Julia took her concerns to Henderson because he was supposed to punish the enslaved laborers who misbehaved. So Julia told Henderson who was misbehaving and he was supposed to have them flogged. In December 1825, Julia wrote to Richard, who was in DC. Choctaw Academy had just opened, so she was much busier than normal. To add to her troubles, she couldn't get two enslaved laborers named Daniel and Jerry to help her take care of a sick student. On top of all of that, all the male field hands had snuck off and left the plantation, except for two men named Sandy and Jacob. 
This aggravated Julia partly because these kinds of disciplinary issues arose every winter when Richard was in Washington. Frustrated, she wrote to her husband. Richard was furious. Over the next three months, he wrote several letters to Thomas Henderson about how to handle the situation. He told Henderson to talk to Julia, figured out who had been causing her trouble, and then whipped the offenders. If he didn't want to flog the men himself, Henderson was ordered to call a constable to come and beat the laborers in question. As a last resort, the troublemakers were to be sold to Edward C. Johnson's cotton farm. It's clear from even this one incident that Blue Springs laborers didn't always respect Julia's leadership. While many slave mistresses had issues when their husbands and fathers were away, Julia's situation was exacerbated by race. In what appears to be a case of while the cat's away, the mice will play, the field hands at Blue Spring pushed the limits of Julia's authority to see how far they could go when Richard was in DC. Julia, like many other Southern mistresses, thus had to call on white men, including Thomas Henderson, local constable, and her own neighbors, to help carry out the disciplinary actions required to enforce her authority, since she was unable, and quite likely perhaps unwilling as an enslaved black woman, to punish the offenders herself. Although Julia needed Thomas's help in some ways, he was not in charge over her. Julia wrote to Richard and kept him informed about what was happening on the farm in his absence. In one of those letters, Julia had complained to Richard about the situation with Daniel and Jerry. She also let him know if Thomas was doing a good job. In, a, in January and February of 1826, Julia wrote that the headmaster had been quite useful of late. He had given Daniel, the, the problem slave, a stern lecture. And he was regularly visiting the couple's house to hear Adeline and Imogene's lessons, which had a good influence on their daughters. And he had also been of great help in making the field hands behave. Johnson then wrote to thank Thomas. While he may have been grateful that the man was keeping up his end of their deal, tutoring the couple's daughters and helping Julia maintain discipline at Blue Spring in return for his job and free housing on the farm, Richard likely also wanted Thomas to know that if he didn't do his job, Julia would let him know. One of Julia's other significant responsibilities was organizing and hosting the various soirees that were held at the Johnson residence. Richard was well known for his hospitality. Indeed, when he was home from Washington, he loved to entertain, and entertain lavishly. People said that they were treated so well when they visited Blue Spring that they just loved to go. Adam Tuno was very much like Richard in this respect. A prominent wine merchant in Charleston, South Carolina, Tuno was actively involved in the St. Andrews Society, the city's preeminent mutual aid organization, and his social circle included men of great power and influence. He also enjoyed hosting wine and dinner parties at his home on Charleston's illustrious East Bay. It was Adam's wife of 40 years, Margaret Benningall, who organized the parties for which Adam was famous. A black woman who may have been enslaved, Margaret, like Julia, was known to be a God-fearing, church-going woman. She ran Adam's home, raised their children, oversaw the work of the enslaved laborers who lived in small dwellings scattered about the couple's yard and carried the keys to the estate on her belt. Known as the head and front of the Tuno household, contemporaries acknowledged Margaret as, quote, the mistress of Adam's household, just as Kentuckians knew that Julia Chin was, quote, the mistress of the parlor at Blue Spring Farm. Julia got used to planning and hosting events, large and small, often on the spur of the moment. When he came home from Congress in 1824, for example, Richard and some of his neighbors got together and invited the entire township to join them at Blue Spring Farm on July 3rd to celebrate the nation's birthday. No ball, however, was as grand or important as when the Johnsons hosted the Marquis de Lafayette in May 1825. Julia was likely excited to meet the man, known as he was for his abolitionist views. It's doubtful that the French hero, on a tour to visit the friends he had made during the American Revolution, would have visited tiny Georgetown had it non, not been for Richard, then at the, quote, noontide of his prosperity. Richard was very popular in the 1820s. He was a hero of the War of 1812. He had supposedly killed the native chief Tecumseh, and he was a sitting U.S. senator. 
he also belonged to one of the first families of Kentucky. His parents had helped to found the state and established one of the most important Baptist churches in the area. His father, Robert, was, among other things, one of the signers of the Kentucky State Constitution. The Johnson men, thanks to Robert's position as a territorial surveyor, owned tens of thousands of acres of the best land in Kentucky. And among them counted congressmen, federal judges, and one day a vice president of the United States. It's not an exaggeration to say that Richard Mentor Johnson belonged to his century's version of the one percenters. The gala that took place at Blue Spring Farm for the Marquis was a sight to behold. Well-dressed enslaved laborers poured out vast quantities of wine and punch, and the sound of music carried into the air as hundreds of people of all classes streamed towards Julia and Richard's home. Every girl in town was there, regardless of her station, dressed for the occasion, and each household in the neighborhood had helped to prepare various parts of the feast, since the festivities were on a scale well beyond the capabilities of any one family. Trenches had been dug, dug by enslaved laborers along an actual branch of the Blue Spring for cooking roasts, and ladies from the area reportedly made a cheese that weighed 500 pounds in honor of the occasion. I, I can't imagine that cheese. <laughs> Entertainment included a stirring speech from young Richard M. Johnson, Jr., the 12-year-old nephew and ward of Richard Mentor Johnson, piano performances by certain female guests, and exhibitions by various students from Choctaw Academy. When Lafayette finally left Blue Spring that day, quote, he entered his carriage amidst the heartiest greetings of a large assemblage of citizens who had gathered to take their last leave of him, end quote. Most of the work for the feast was done by the enslaved house staff at Blue Spring, and it was Julia Chin who oversaw the entire event and made sure that everything was prepared perfectly, given her role as, quote, the chief manager of the domestic concerns of the house. And it's almost certain that Julia and her daughters met the Marquis during his visit to their home. Not only did Richard, did Richard recognize Julia, quote, as his wife, the mistress of his parlor, and the mother of his household, which was confirmed by everyone who knew him, he unblushingly treated the girls as his daughters, placing them at the same table with the most honorable of his white guests, end quote. Visitors who went to Blue Spring that day verified that Imogene and Adeline Johnson were at the party. In fact, they had played the piano for the general that evening. The girls were 13 and 11 years old when the marquee came to visit and they were wearing gowns as fine as money could buy. Julia would have purchased these dresses or had them specially made for the occasion. Local paper maker Ebenezer Stedman remarked that to anyone who didn't know them, Imogene and Adeline would have been mistaken for white, since they were as light-skinned as any of the other ladies in attendance that night. And there were folks from all walks of life at Blue Spring the day the Marquis de Lafayette came to visit. Rich and poor, male and female, native black and white, the residents of Georgetown all ate, drank, and danced well into the night. As if dealing with an unhappy labor force, keeping her husband apprised on a variety of plantation matters, raising the couple's two daughters, and running a 2,000-acre farm when Richard was away, plus entertaining hundreds of guests at a moment's notice wasn't enough, Richard also helped Thomas Henderson manage Choctaw Academy during Richard's absences. Having the boarding school at Blue Spring allowed Julia to quietly educate her daughters under Henderson's tutelage, but it also increased her workload. While Thomas was headmaster, he was in charge of teaching and disciplining the students. It was Julia who oversaw the practical tasks that kept the institution functioning. This was a boarding school. Julia and her helpers, meaning the enslaved laborers that she oversaw, had to ensure that every student was clothed, fed, housed, that their clothing and bed linens were cleaned, their rooms maintained, and that they remained healthy. This was not a small job. There was a reason that Julia had developed a reputation for being, quote, the chief manager of the domestic concerns of the house, end quote. Raising two children and running a household for a politician who loved to entertain on a grand scale was no small task. Julia, however, did all this and more, stepping into her new roles at Choctaw Academy with grace. Having been trained as a house servant, she had learned to sew and cook under the apprenticeship of the talented black seamstresses and cooks on Robert and Jemima Johnson's farm. These tools and more were put to use for the new school. For example, it was Julia who organized and directed a team of skilled black seamstresses at Blue Spring to make all the students' clothing. 
She also looked after the student's medical issues, being, quote, as good as one half the physicians where the complaint is not dangerous. Indeed, her work in this area was significant. She was so effective, Richard didn't have to, have to hire a doctor to care for the school students until after her death. It's likely that Julia acquired her medical school skills, like the rest of her domestic abilities, from the black women on the plantation where she grew up. Enslaved women passed herbal remedies, knowledge about midwifery, and other medicinal information down from mother to daughter. We can thus assume that Julia learned most of what she knew from other black women, including her own mother, Henrietta. Julia was also in charge of setting up all the beds for the students. This included buying coarse linen from William Johnson's store in town to make the mattresses, the bed ticks, and negotiating with a local craftsman named Mr. Campbell to construct the actual bedsteads. While it's unclear how much of the physical labor of mattress making Julia did herself and how much she delegated to the enslaved women of Blue Spring, she saved the household money by furnishing some things at home with her own labor. Richard indicated, however, that even if Julia had to purchase everything, he would not object. Indeed, indeed he stated that, quote, as to everything else, Julia has the means and can accomplish it. Perhaps she might want some aid in having a contract made for the bedsteads for the upper part of the library, end quote. Julia clearly provided a wide variety of labor to make Choctaw Academy run smoothly. What's critical to note here is that she had access to Richard's money while he was away, which indicates that there was a high level of trust between the pair. When Richard stated that if Julia had to, quote, purchase everything, I do not object, end quote, or that, quote, as to everything else, Julia has the means and can accomplish it, end quote, he likely wasn't referring to hard currency. He probably meant she could place orders and enter into contracts with local vendors for the goods needed at Blue Spring, since stores in the U.S. functioned on credit in the antebellum era, especially in the rural South. This is still significant, however. It meant that Julia could draw on Richard's local lines of credit, which meant area merchants recognized her right to do so. This means that in the Bluegrass region, Julia legally functioned as Richard's wife for the purposes of transacting business. Richard did, uh, Julia did, however, control some physical currency. She would pay seasonal laborers at Blue Spring using the cash that Richard left her every year. And in a letter to Thomas Henderson in February 1826, Richard noted that, quote, after the 4th of March, I can send the boys some spending money. Or if they do not choose to wait, Julia will hand you $10 silver for distribution for spending money if they want it. That would be the equivalent of about $300 today. Julia thus not only had the right to use Richard's lines of credit in order to purchase materials for both school and house, she also had access to and distributed cash, both to the farm's white employees and to the academy's headmaster. It's telling that Thomas, a white man who had known Richard for years, and who was the school's headmaster and an ordained Baptist minister, was not sent this money directly. Instead, he had to ask Julia, a woman of African descent and legally an enslaved woman, but who was clearly the mistress of the plantation for these funds. Julia, very, Richard very obviously trusted Julia, and he knew that she was a savvy businesswoman. When referring to the work that needed to be done with regards to the school, he wrote that Julia could accomplish everything. His statement that perhaps she might want some aid in having a contract made for the bedsteads for the upper part of the library suggests that she was perfectly capable of handling these matters. Richard never said that Julia definitely needed help, just that she might. It implied that Henderson should provide this aid, but only if Julia requested it. And she might have done so if Mr. Campbell was being difficult. It would have been useful to have a white man on hand if Campbell was hostile or tried to cheat her. Not every merchant in the area would have been comfortable dealing with the black woman who was running things at Blue Spring Farm. Life was hardly restful for Julia Chin. Being the wife of a politician from one of Kentucky's first families didn't mean she enjoyed a life of luxury. The success of Blue Spring Farm and Choctaw Academy were the direct result of her constant work and supervision. She labored long days at the head of a slave force that worked even harder. Her sudden death while caring for the school's students during a cholera epidemic in 1833, at the age of 37, thus affected the life of every single person who lived at Blue Spring. Richard certainly missed her organizational capabilities. 
Within months of her passing, letters flooded the Choctaw Nation from students at the school, complaining about everything from poor food and clothing to suspect education and dirty living conditions. Richard, overwhelmed, tried to address the conditions and persuade the chiefs not to take their children home. He stated, quote, I can pledge myself that there is not a day in the year that coffee is not furnished for every boy in the school and that of the best quality, except during the cholera when there was some derangement in the cooking owing to the death of the formidable cook and the sickness of others, end quote. Julia, of course, who normally ensured that everything ran smoothly at the school, had been busy nursing everyone during the epidemic. She then fell sick and passed away from cholera shortly after Jerry, the school's cook, died as well. Two days later, Richard wrote to Henderson and asked him to make sure that the students kept their rooms and clothes clean and tidy. Quote, therefore you must keep your eyes upon their clothes and if necessary you can get Adeline or Parthene, another enslaved woman, to furnish any deficient so as to keep them to look well and this without exciting other boys and without letting any person know the object for I have said nothing of these complaints even to Adeline. Perhaps the chiefs may be referring to letters soon after the cholera when matters were deranged, end quote. Clearly matters were deranged because Julia Chin, who had always overseen things at Blue Spring, including the sewing and distribution of student clothing at the academy, had died. It's obvious given how things changed after her death, how much Julia had contributed to the smooth running of both farm and school. Equally clear from the details of her daily routine at Blue Spring Farm is that Julia Chin had lived a very full life and that local whites appeared to be accepting of the Chin-Johnson relationship to a large extent. Educated, well-dressed, exercising oversight over the farm's enslaved laborers, dealing with local vendors, and interacting with the students of Choctaw Academy, Julia's life looked, in many respects, like those of her white female neighbors. Some of the people she dealt with, like Thomas Henderson, would become close colleagues. Other locals either ignored her marriage to Richard or accepted it to a point, attending the parties she organized, worshiping alongside her at Great Crossing Baptist Church, and doing business with her when Richard was away. For centuries, there were white folks in this country who claimed that interracial unions didn't exist, or that they only took place amongst poor whites who lived with their black lovers in secrecy and shame. Such parameters clearly do not reflect the lives of Julia Chin and Richard Johnson. Their relationship illuminates the gaps that, have, that existed between the ideals that antebellum Americans projected about themselves versus the substance of life on the ground in their society. As new work is beginning to reveal, this rhetoric against interracial sex versus the daily local toleration of it and the space between the two held its course from places on the eastern seaboard to the new frontier, from rural locales to urban ports, from places in the deep south to Washington, DC. As I begin to wrap up my conclusion, I believe that it's critical we broadcast stories like Julia Chin's Far and Wide. Black, white, and native peoples have been sexually involved with one another since they first encountered each other. Interracial sex was and is so common in the Americas between people of all classes and races that we know Julia's story cannot have been unique. But there is more information on Julia than on many other enslaved women who were in such relationships, except perhaps for Sally Hemings. Because Julia was married to a national political figure, it meant that more people were talking about her. So there are more public sources on her, particularly newspapers. It's partly what helped me to write my book, even though we don't have Richard's personal papers. This means we're able to recreate parts of Julia's story, and we can, to a certain extent, use that information to make reasonable assumptions about what life was like for other women in similar situations. A quintessentially American family saga the story of Julia and her daughters also reveals how the United States is still struggling with the effects of slavery and interracial sex. While conducting research, I was saddened but not surprised by how Julia, like most enslaved women, had been erased from US history. Few people today know her name. 
The truth is that Julia and Richard are both victims of our continued national refusal to acknowledge our history of slavery and interracial sex. This has played out in various ways, including but not limited to a long-standing violent commitment to segregation, the corresponding construction of the one-drop rule of blackness, and an unwillingness to accept the existence of biracial and multiracial persons, even after Loving versus Virginia legalized interracial marriage in 1967. And a, comp and a comparable inability until quite recently for people to self-identify as multiracial on government forms and records. This reality of historical, erasial, uh, historical erasure, of people's dilemmas with black-white binary created by structural racism, and the struggle with history and memory was driven home to me when I met and interviewed some of Julia and Richard's descendants. It wasn't something I ever thought would happen. I'm a slavery scholar. I research dead people. The thought of meeting any of Julia's family members just hadn't occurred to me, and when I did, their stories surprised me, because none of them knew until much later in life that they were descended from a vice president and his enslaved black wife. This was not an accident. Julia Chin hadn't just been removed from the history books of the nation. She had been erased from the memories of her own kin. At some point in the early 20th century, members of the family crossed the color line and stopped telling their children the truth about their family's lineage. Although, quote, in Kentucky, the general banter was always, oh, well, we all have black blood in our history, end quote, white families never admitted that they, in fact, actually had black ancestry. When I asked Bill Jackson, a descendant of Julian Richard, through the Pence line, no, it's not Mike Pence. I know you're thinking it, so I'm just going to say it why he thought his family lineage had been hidden from him for most of his life, he remarked, quote, you know, it's a closeted secret. It's not something that people were necessarily proud of. I know it's certainly been hush-hush in our family, and whenever it comes up in other families, it's just as hush-hush, end quote. The Pences, descendants of Julia Ann Chin and Richard Mentor Johnson through their older daughter, Imogene Johnson Pence, are your typical American family. As one descendant concluded, if you've been here long enough and you go back far enough, quote, people are all mixed up together, end quote. Native, African, European, this is the Southern story. It's the American story. It's sex, it's race, and it's slavery. It's also a story that many people still deny. It's why Julia and her daughters were written out of the history books and hidden from the memories of their own descendants. It's uncomfortable because Richard owned Julia because blackness was and still is treated as a stigma, because our history of slavery and settler colonialism has yet to be fully acknowledged. It's why some people are trying to eliminate the teaching of chattel slavery and other historical realities, including indigenous genocide from our schools. They claim that educating children in critical race theory, or CRT, is divisive. Not only do these people not even know what CRT really is, this isn't about CRT. The truth is these people are afraid of change. This is about the retention of power, Ultimately, it's about the maintenance of white supremacy. If we want to begin the national healing process and move forward in any meaningful way, stories like Julia's are what we must embrace. We must face our history. People of color will be the majority of the US by 2043, which is only one generation. It's time we step into that future by accepting the country's interracial past and all that comes with it. By bringing Julia and her daughters front and center into the American narrative, that is what we begin to do. By acknowledging who we are, were and are, we begin to see a much more realistic vision of who we can and will be. People speak of peace and of reconciliation. I say there can be no reconciliation without truth. That means an honest accounting of our intertwined collective and often painful histories. The only way out is through. Thank you.